Nadine's room, yes. So I got this when I was uh, two, three, and it has come along with me. And what was significant was there weren't many things that had the name Nadine. Uh, so somebody must have had it painted, hand painted. And they did a nice job. And it looks surprisingly like me. Look. I was going to say which came first, but. And then what I want to say is, I don't know if you noticed, she's got freckles. I've never had freckles, but now I'm getting age spots, so I thought it would work out uh, for the future. Anyway, so I'm moving. And as you know, I am ready to move along. So today I took this off the door of my office. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it'll go upstate and it'll go in my my new house, my new old house. Uh, I have two comments slash questions. One is, did it really matter that you had a placard that said Nadine's room? Would, would the room have been any different without that placard? And Two is, do we really own anything? I mean, we talk about leaving our home, but it, it's really just this, we, we all just agreed that that's your home, right? That's, that's just yeah, a, a yeah, social yeah, construct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So some people I, say that your home is wherever you are at the time, mm -hmm. right? No, I feel, well, all right. So I do think I have this attachment to objects and nostalgia so okay. it's like it's like this object and i actually have never looked at the back of it so when i took it off the door i looked and now this is the first time i read it and i'm like h and r johnson limited made in england and then i think about all right my mother must have bought this or my grandmother must have bought this so who bought this for me i was a little girl and all that all that involves and i remember that room I remember the room in Jersey City this was on. And then it went to me with me to uh, northern New Jersey for a handful of years and then to East Northport. I don't think I hung it up for East Northport. It was just like in the drawer because I don't think I ever moved into East Northport. And then I think it went to Sayville and now it's here. This house was 20 years though, pretty much. So... Yeah. So that's kind of crazy. And yeah, and I mean, you think about it, everything changes. You know, people come, people go. Life itself changes, society changes, everything changes. But the one constant you have is like sometimes material objects. And when everything's so tumultuous, you can always count on like a house to be that house. That's why it's so devastating when like, house fires happen or floods or things like that because you lose that sense of familiarity that you almost took for granted but it is true like that we're all living on land we don't necessarily technically own it like it's all made up like money deeds for the house like the land is the land and it belongs as much to you as it belongs to the the bugs underneath it and the next yeah, until you have to pay capital gains <laughs> uh i but 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 you're right in that why did i need to articulate my own space but i will say from a young age i always wanted to have my own ha space I, as a little kid like five years old i remember somebody had an outbuilding and i was like that's exactly the move i want to live i remember that moment where I said, oh, so I could have a house on my parents' property. I don't have to live with these people anymore. Like, I definitely had one foot out the door because I had a sense of independence. So I guess the space to me means independence. But couldn't that just be an, an ob you're just objectifying or externalizing something that you feel internally, which is that you're looking for that independence? Because as someone who grew up in an apartment, uh, space was a premium and really there was no, no such thing as personal space. So when you, when you were growing up, the only personal space you really had was in your mind, uh, which sort of taught you when to speak and when not to speak and when to hold your tongue and when not to hold your tongue. Um, 
I know I've always I've always thought of space not just in terms of uh, physical space, but this this conceptual space of the space of the mind in a sense. Like your, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. Like your thoughts can be expansive, but they can also be limiting. Um, and th sometimes you have to share them, and sometimes you don't have to share them. So maybe you don't need space at all. Maybe you're just externalizing an emotion. Yeah, and but at the, the same time, you know, where are you going to be yourself? Sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, you need space to be able to express yourself, and there sometimes that requires a physical space, you know, like there's but not always. That's my time. Point. Yeah. 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 Well, and you went to, when you went to Italy, mm -hmm. uh, to that, that, that sense of place. And it, I think, but it must've also been meaningful to you that, that the family history. So it was more than just, uh, you know, it, it became, you know, a, a physical space. Yes. But an emotional space too. Yes, and, and going back to you know, if we're going back to objects, the the idea that objects connect you to a past, not not necessarily the, because now I'm thinking about superstitions and paganism yeah. and animism, and there's a connection there. I haven't made it yet, but um, what, what? Why do we invest meaning in objects that are clearly inanimate and in a lot of cases mass produced? Right. If I mean, if you I lost mean, that, you could probably get another one. Well, I will say I did get rid of a mug today that was my grandmother's. The handle broke and it was a Maxwell House mug because Maxwell House used to be, I think, in Hoboken. Um, and so the whole town smelled like coffee. And but it was had it a an actual house. I think it, I think it was uh, it. it uh, uh, my mind is blown now. Now, Maxwell House, and I just threw the mug out. I'm going to go dig it out. No, because I said it's broken, and it's an object, and it's you don't have to save every morsel. Were you drinking of your... out of it? No, I had my pens in it, and so, I have. Did I... you really need a handle then? No, but I have about five, six different pen mugs. I mean, you can't imagine the excess we have. And yeah, yeah, and so. But I mean, you think about it. People get so attached to them. But it, you've it, seen Toy Story. Everybody's seen Toy Story, and people almost like personify objects to fulfill blanks that they feel like sometimes they can't get in other people. But I think it has to do. Remember, I we were talking about uh, happiness and novelty. You yeah. know, the idea. You know, so 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 I recognize that there is this sense of. Uh, novelty in the object, but this is actually the reverse of that. This is like because it's it's the opposite of novelty. Yeah, you're holding on to, to something that that's a, a comfort rather mm -hmm. than something new. Right, it connects, but, it connects you to where you were, not to where you're going. Right. Yeah. But Tony, you're right. Like I think about it. The stuff oftentimes becomes a barrier because you're so busy paying for the stuff well there's right. an ex there's a reason they call things baggage right they're like when you're carrying baggage yeah 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 right it's it, it's not there because you're gonna need it it's there because it's holding you back i mean when you talk about having to mark your territory in a sense uh, <laughs> i've always preferred the opposite i i like the idea of anonymity so i don't put any bumper stickers on my car i don't want people you know, on the highway, like knowing who I'm going to vote for in the next election or, you know, things that I feel strongly about. Like, why, why do I need to project that to absolute yeah. strangers? To virtue signal. To what? I'm sorry? Virtue signal. I know, but that's, that's almost like a humble brag, right? Like, if I, if I have to signal my virtue, then how virtuous am I really? Your point that was made, like, I don't know, it was like two minutes ago, but it was about how money was like a societal construct. Like, yeah, it is, but also it, it, like, represents something that's very much not, which is, like, value, right? Like, the whole idea of, like, something is valuable, like an object has value. Well, barter is just too difficult. I mean, I, if we had to go back to barter, we'd never get anything done. Hey, we I bartered no, this, I, barter for this haircut. I didn't pay for this. I gave Prosecco. And look how fabulous. But that's that's one transaction. But if we're, <laughs> yeah, if we're gonna yeah, think no. about if we're gonna yeah, think about billions of transactions every day, big and small. I mean, if you had to barter your house, what what what? So that's an interesting yeah, question. No, I, if you had I, to swap I agree, your house for something other than money, what would it be? 
Okay. Gold, gold would be actually. It's the what can you do with gold? Out. Can you, you can look at it? Yeah, you, you can't do anything with gold. I guess I don't know. It has some I, semiconductor I, applications, and it could also it's why it's, it's like used. In it's like, only valuable because people say it is right. That's why on the money it says "In God We Trust" because yeah. that's pretty much all we can count on. I trade it all for <laughs> I tr I would trade it all all the objects for things that can't be changed. Like for I would trade all the objects. Well, I mean, yeah, those things you can't you can't put a price on. Okay. Right. Yeah, I just I think it's important to remember the fact that how much of what we think is important, how much we stress about, is stuff that humans have created for themselves as a species. And like, if you really wanted to, at any point, you could go run off in the woods and start growing your own food and you know this you don't need it to survive and while it's important in the society to re to respect money respect respect establishment but you know it's it's important to also have that perspective you know well i think there's a difference between money as a means of transaction which is very efficient and then money as a goal in life right the accumulation yeah. of money yeah so there are things that are just infinitely useful but then if you lose sight of what you're doing and you just focus exclusively on, it's like grades, right? Like when you go to school, right? And I know Richard's not that kind of student, but imagine if you had no interest in school other than grades and you really lose sight of why you started to go to school or what yeah, you hope yeah. to gain from going to school or just learning in general. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be an enriching experience, something that improves your life and spurs you on to do more. I think my time in some aspects with some teachers or like in public school when I was in middle school like teachers who aren't willing to make that initiative do make it about test scores and stuff like that and it becomes less about learning and more about appearing good on paper and that's that's really what takes the fun out of it because education is supposed to be an enriching experience and that's exactly what you guys are doing with the show is making it so that it's engaging, so that it's enriching, so that it doesn't feel like it's just a grade. That it's actually like teaching you about topics in a way that puts the humanity back into it. I guess that's what happens when you pursue, I, I mean, if you replace the word money or grades with value, right? Because that's really what it is. You pursue owning value at the cost of actually realizing like why you were pursuing that value in the first place, which to, yes, exactly. to make sure that you enjoy this like, limited amount of time on earth because we're all a bunch of monkeys floating on a blue marble exactly uh, like on a blue marble floating through space right and like you know just enjoy it like help other people like just that sort of good natured you know whole, you know wholesomeness is sort of lost in the endless pursuit for value right yeah. oh there's intrinsic value right you can learn something because it has value to you uh, and then there's extrinsic which is that value that's it's not really connected to you. It's more of a means to an end. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the character yeah, the, the idea problem. of how much we people desire clout and like status and how much we, you know, you want the special LeBron shoes because that gives you status. But does is it any different than a Nike? Not really. Is it any different than a New Balance you got from the, the thrift store? No. They, they but also it has the cream on it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's what's interesting. I mean, in, in general, most of the stuff in this house, we we either found in a garbage, we got it at a thrift store, like uh, anything that's been really was kind of inherited or whatnot. I've already moved. There's a handful of things I'm going to take from here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just now it really is like assessing the excess of the accumulation. Yeah, and you can be excess and still be thrifty about it. You know, people think just because it costs a little, like costs less, it doesn't mean you should buy it. You know, that's yeah. that's how they get you at, at like Walmart or stores like that. You know, oh, it's only five dollars. Mm -hmm. well, Twenty five dollar purchases later, you know, <laughs> or buy one get one, right? Like oh well, yeah, 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 exactly. It was on sale, but if you didn't buy it at all, then you'd be you you'd already be up. But the house for me is is obviously very symbolic, and that's why um, 
you know, that's my my master's thesis is about the house and symbolic space. So I, I, I recognize that it is about the object because I think it represents certain human elements. And, and I think uh, apartment living, uh, as my family has lived in apartments, I don't think I think those spaces, it's not about the ownership for me, really, uh, in that regard, the heart of the house is from the people and 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 just to be thankful that you have a space and i know i mean yeah. that to have my own space has been a very big luxury and to have this discussion at all is a luxury so i'm kind of it yeah. is it is a it is a philosophical reflection as i spent the day sorting sorting right yeah. obviously if i like sorting uh as a hobby Right, as you've noticed, Mr. Vitorino, uh, right. I like sorting through stuff, and um, I'm doing that today with an eye toward why. Why do I have this? You know, so so it's been it's been reflected. But so out of all the stuff I've I'm boxing up or trying to get to other people, um, this is the thing I'm like I'm like walking around with though. This, this is not, you know, yeah. it's like somehow that's like this talisman yeah. of, of identity. Where do you think, not, not to, to, to piggyback off of that, where do you think you will go as you move into your new space? Where do you think it'll take you? As a person? I mean, as a person, creatively, yeah. you know, brain-wise you know, all of it, you know, how do you think it, it will change you out of well, Long Island? Yeah. Well, Long Island has been a necessary evil, uh, but evil it is. And nevertheless, I've been trying to get off Long Island since 1978, but, uh, going now. what's that? Are you any closer? Oh yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm, I'm 700. <laughs> You're very close. I'm 724 days away. Uh, but you're crazy. That, you don't, you don't know how to do math, but you can count down numbers like that. Math, my mind. math, and math, and uh, you know, counting are different. And and when money's involved and freedom's involved, uh, yeah, I'm good at math. Um, because <laughs> that's a conceptual thing. That's when freedom is involved, ooh, spicy. Well, there was a week ago where we were working on. I was writing. I was writing something, and we were messing around with some TBD and I was editing and I was doing a lot of stuff up in Athens and I was reading and I felt like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And it's, it's not so much uh, that I want to even travel at this point. I want intellectual freedom to pursue the time to pursue what I want to read, what I want to make, what the artwork. Uh, I just want freedom in that regard. Um, which is a huge thing. Uh, there are some people who will never have that kind of freedom, and I. So I want to use it. So I want to use. It. Well, it, it, it's interesting you say that. I I've been watching uh, for fun. I've been watching this series on the bubonic plague, <laughs> and the uh, the. <laughs> the now, nothing says nothing says fun like that. Only uh, relevant. So the uh, but the uh, it's it's hosted by this professor from Purdue University, and she's actually a medieval literature professor. So she's mm. not a history professor. She's not a, a, an epidemiologist or anything like that. And she made the point that you can judge the, uh, the success of a society based on how it treats its artists. So if, if you can earn a living as an artist, like you're just a poet, you're not a lawyer who, you know, on the side writes poetry or a teacher on the side who makes art but that if you can, if society can support you in your endeavors as an artist, then that is the most successful society you can have. Obviously, she has a bias because she's an academic. And from her point of view, right, her success is a reflection of a society's success. Uh, mm -hmm. But I thought that was an interesting point that we tend to uh, shy away, especially, I think, when we create these, when there's this economic anxiety and social change, we tend to stick to things that we think are hard sciences, not soft sciences, uh, or arts, forget arts, right? That's, those are the first things we cut in education when budgets go down. Uh, and even when people are picking careers, right? they call people starving artists for a reason. 
Uh, it's almost implied when you say the word artist that you, you hear, you know, you hear the word starving, even if your parents aren't saying it. Uh, well, what's interesting is that when you look at the distance learning, the best lessons come from the arts, though. You know, the in terms of um, listening to music or it just it just makes it I think it's a more engaging medium than just straight lecture. So if you're looking through the lens of um, of how an idea is manifested in the arts, it seems to be more inspirational. And that goes back to that idea of the muse, yeah. you know, the idea of, of uh, elevating, art elevating us. And that's been discussed mm -hmm. for a really long time. Yeah. If I look at the, this is, so when you talk about the house, obviously this is a collection of paintings from, I don't know, this is, some of these were done in 1997. And so all the way to today, well, not today, today, but so obviously I have this thing about the house and mm -hmm. the house being anthropomorphic. So, and it doesn't have to necessarily be about the ownership. It's the house is almost beyond the people in it. Um, and so, yeah, you know, what I, what I realized is that I assumed everyone understood my goof. Some of this is all, you know, a, a, it's like a little like birdhouse. This one's birdhouse. Um, you know, so I, ha, ha, like I try and do a little pun there, but mm -hmm. um, it was always about this this tension between man and nature, and the house was man, obviously. And I I realized that there were some people who didn't uh, know that that was the goof I was making that this tension between man and nature. So um, I thought that was, this is Ant Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. wah, wah. So I was kind of thinking about houses and, and, you know, obviously spend a lot of time. This, this one is the one I think I, this is actually a very small panel. And uh, I had worked on this painting, I would say almost 10 years. And I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, so it was this panel. I did a painting that was all white. It was like a white on white house in the snow. So the house is pretty much the same. So then I worked on the landscape and then I eventually put in flowers. I put in the trees in the horizon I made it nighttime. And then I sat on it for probably another, I don't know, three, four, five years. And I said, you know what it needs? It needs an octopus. And this octopus um, is because it, it, the painting is only about seven in inches tall. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it was like really this miniature. Uh, like a five by seven? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then I made its own frame. I had some old molding I put together and uh, I actually won a prize for this at the uh, cultural center in Athens. But what I like is that you, you, you have the, is the octopus moving in or coming out? And why is he on land? So the idea of why did, is the octopus invading or is it escaping? So that was kind of where I, you know, so I realized a number of my house, house paintings are about escaping or, yeah, because I, I even, I have, uh, if I go back. I mean, it could be both. It's just a matter of what, what are we seeing in the frame, right? Mm -hmm. Might be invading in order to escape something. Right, right. Well, they might be invading in order to escape something. Interesting. I mean, throughout history, there have been massive migrations. Yeah. Um, so, and that, whether it was e ecological change or political change or historical change, um, the octopus could be in exile for all we know. Yes, yes, absolutely. You are 100% right. Yeah. Uh, this is a painting of the Thomas Cole House mm -hmm. in Catskill. And across the river is Olana, which was, uh, what's his name, Frederick Church, who was Hudson River School. So what happened was Thomas Cole 
It was like they were collaborators. And so they, uh, Thomas Cole was basically founded the Hudson River School, but died young. And then uh, I think it's Frederick Church. I can't remember his first name. Somebody can hit the Google on that. Uh, he was very financially successful and built the, the big the big house. So I, I thought it was interesting that you can and you can visit both houses and they're open as museums. The Thomas Cole house in Catskill is a lot cheaper to get into, which is funny. And uh, but now they're connected with a walkway across the river. There's a bridge and they made a pedestrian walkway. So I think it's an interesting collaboration. I did a painting. Uh, I was supposed to donate this. They were having an exhibition where you could um, do a painting, but I couldn't get upstate to drop it off. So I ended up keeping the painting. But I think it uh, relates to kind of what you were doing this week with the um, your stuff, your mm -hmm. uh, collaboration and your in-service idea of uh, that connection between. So fingers. since you mentioned this, this idea of famous people's houses, and it, and it gets me thinking about if houses are, are something that are, uh, it's personal, then what's our fascination with visiting the, the homes of famous people, right? Right. Really, all we care about is what they were good at or what made them famous. Do we really need to know, you know, you know, the kitchen they sat in and where they made sandwiches? Does it matter? Like, I went to Italy, and and in Rome, on the Spanish Steps, there's there's a pl there's a plaque in front of a small house that says uh, John Keats lived here, right? And there's another one that's Percy Shelley. Does it really matter that Percy Shelley lived in that house? I mean, if you could just walk past it and that plaque weren't there, you would never know. I think down uh, in downtown New York, there is a place where Theodore Roosevelt was born. Like, why do we do that? Why, right. why do we connect the house to this success? The house had nothing, did not contribute to anyone's success. So why do we care? Well, that that is interesting because you have all these things that say, you know, Washington slept here, right? Yeah. So this idea of the, the historicity of mm -hmm. the space, and it becomes, you know, it it becomes, I guess, like a diorama. But at the um, time, no one recognized it at the time. No one said, you know, George Washington slept there one day. This we're gonna charge we're gonna charge a pretty penny for people to come look at this room. Like at the yeah. time no one acknowledged it. It's only in, in hindsight that we assign value to things that maybe weren't that valuable, like that Maxwell House mug. I mean Right. But as as an Italian, the history, you go back and you look at those those steps and, and think about how many people have walked these steps. I mean, you have to you're a history major. Mm -hmm. uh, you 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 certainly have a sense of. Of how the object represents the history on some level. Well, I. I I, I had a professor in Italy when I was studying abroad who said that uh, Rome, that Italy in a sense lives in the shadow of the of great things that happened 500 years ago. <laughs> such a burden to that yeah. compared to the United States where uh, we practically have no sense of history. Yeah, we have national holidays and we celebrate uh, the founding fathers, but there's no sense that we have to somehow live up to those ideals uh, or that we have to replicate that what they they i mean there's a hope that if if we inherited this democracy that we keep it going uh but there's not that sense of you know this this is who we are as americans and if you take this away from us then you're taking away our national identity and i think for italians there's, there's that burden of we have to hold on to the past because it's it's like almost like a business right you hold on to your past success but sometimes you miss what, what your next success can be, right? It, it, that's that sense of, of, of continual improvement and continually evolving. Um, so I, I find Italians to be very modern people, but then when it comes to their their national identity, it's always, the descriptors are always based not on where Italy's going, but where they've been and what they've done, not what they're going to do. Well, I think you're starting to see that a little bit in the United States, like with Trump's whole campaign slogan was make America great again, which was like, in turn borrowed from Ronald Reagan's, uh, let's make America great again in his 1980 presidential campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think there is a sense in the United States of like, 
like after World War II, the United States was the predominant economic power. Like people saw the United States as an opportunity. And in the 1950s and 1960s, it was very, very easy for young people to get a house, that sort of thing, in order to pay the bills, right? Jobs were plentiful and uh, the United States was the manufacturing hub of the world. And now you can see that like, there's starting to be some more economic stagnation and lower wages and the real estate is getting more expensive. And so I do feel like there is at least a significant portion of Americans uh, living in the rust belt that feel like there is like a better past. You so I, mean? I, I would, I would say that you raise a good point, but uh, I'm going to also disagree with you because I think what they're missing is not the jobs. Uh, I think what they're missing is is this uh, sense of privilege that's being challenged. Mm. And so, because yeah, the 50s and 60s were great for some people, but they weren't great for everybody. And so if you were not one of those people who thought it was great, um, you know, it's sort of like the 1950s. I, I, growing up as a kid, I always thought the 1950s were this great time period. Um, you know, based on 1950s television, where nothing ever went wrong. You know, when, when they talk about making America great again, it's only because they have this sense of what they don't like in the present. I, compared to, I think, Italians, when they think about the Renaissance, there was an acknowledgement that what they were doing was cutting edge, right? And so they're just trying to hold on to that. Where I think the people today who talk about making America great again, I don't think they really think it was great. They just don't like what it looks like now, or they don't like what the people look like now. You can say that, and I'm sure there's like a certain element of like what you would think of as racism towards it. But uh, one of the most uh, fascinating things is like I, I love examining data, right? Like I did some sort of artificial intelligence framework. Like I sort of love looking at like data and like because it can tell you so much. And something interesting that you do see is that within – it's very strong within like Ohio, Michigan, like all the states that turned red in 2016 uh -huh. is that you see a straight line correlation between – um, automated jobs and like those jobs shipping to China basically lost jobs um, as, and those uh, districts turning red, right? And I think like, I mean, even if you were to think about it in like, you know, there are like some racists out there. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people do term racist because like, you know, like the immigrants stole their jobs. It's because they like, I don't think anybody wakes up and like chooses to be a racist. I think it's because they've been put in like an impoverished situation or like their jobs have been taken or something along those lines. You know what I mean? Well, um, if, if we could speak to that, the idea of the hometown, you know, we're talking about the home. Well, I would say, and, and there are other studies that cite this as well, that Americans are becoming less mobile, not more mobile. I mean, they have mobile phones or mobile technology, but in terms of the demographic shifts across the country, people are talking about sorting. People are sorting themselves out between urban and rural or uh, urban and suburban and then rural or blue states and red states. So the blue states are becoming more blue in a sense, and the red states are becoming more red. Uh, but I would, I would say that uh, historically, when Americans saw that there were more opportunities in one place as opposed to another, they would go there. I mean, they call that network effects, right? So that's why people move to New York, uh, because they see opportunities there. Uh, so I, I, not to say that it's, it's, uh, it's easy by any means, uh, but there is, there is a history for people to gravitate towards where things are happening and where opportunities exist. And so if, if you prioritize not moving, if you're going to say, I'm not moving until and everything has to move back towards me, uh, that might be a recipe for failure in a sense, right? If, if you're not willing to be flexible because Americans have always had to move, uh, whether west uh, or north, uh, depending on their circumstances. Richard, you take me full circle to the Barack Obama portrait. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is, full circle, uh, because it was about hometowns, right? This idea of, you know, what does our town look like? And this sense of uh, what does a president look like? And so I want to present the, uh, so if we look at the Obama portrait, um, it is a very unusual presidential portrait because it is set in nature and the it's a very large 
painting about seven feet tall. So wow. if, if you compare it to, let's say uh, this, this image, this was a more stand, actually even these were more cutting edge than other presidential portraits. Mm -hmm. But for this one to be so different, it spoke to that this president is so different. So the, it, the expectation that he would, his presidential portrait would look like every other president um, is shattered in that, in that painting. So it becomes less about, um, you know, following that tradition, but more about maybe even becoming a new type of person, that rebirth of an America that has racial equality. May I make an observation? Please, Mr. Judson. That, that I hadn't noticed before. Yes, Obama is sitting in nature, but it's ivy climbing on a wall. It's not like he's in the middle of the forest. Mm -hmm. And we think of ivy climbing up, like, you know, some classical edifice. I hadn't noticed that before. I wonder, I wonder what the artist was trying to say with that. Well, each of those flowers is from a place in Obama's geography. So mm. they were symbolically chosen for the but, different regions, but I'm not sure why so close. No, but again, it, it's not like he's sitting in a flower garden. He's sitting up against, and the chair is so formal. Right. It's really fascinating. It's really it's 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 saying a lot of things that I certainly can't decipher on a quick viewing. It's very very interesting. Yeah. Very complex. What what I find interesting is uh, and I'm not an art history person at all but uh if, when I think of portraiture I think of the subject and the the background is really secondary. Uh but when you present something like this it it seems like it's all about the background. Uh, and maybe that's true of all presidential portraiture, but I think uh, if I were thinking of anyone else's portrait and, and if, if it were in a library, I wouldn't have noticed the library at all. I would just look at the, at the subject matter. Uh, but in this case, it seems to, you can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like the, you know, that Rousseau uh, painting, The Dream? Yeah. Uh, you guys don't know, if you don't know it, I'm going to bring it up. You know, just like this, this as the uh, as the people come out of it, out of the nature. Some people thought it was disrespectful to have him in nature like that um, because it wasn't the traditional portrait of every other uh, president, you know. But, but I think it speaks to a new era and uh, almost like Adam coming out of the garden, you know, but uh, maybe I think too much about these things. Maybe. Uh, so uh, I want to thank everybody for being here talking about houses and art and transitions and objects. Uh, we, we covered a lot of territory today about just all sorts of philosophy. We were talking, Mr. Judson, all about uh, the move, my move and all my stuff and all the excess. And uh, Mr. Vitorino has the audacity to suggest I don't need any of it. And and I said, you're a man who can appreciate just one good spatula. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I second that. Yeah. Well, I told you it's, it's, it's Michelangelo would look at a slab of marble and he could envision what he wanted out of it, and everything else was excess. And that's that's what I would think. Just make a list of what you need, and everything else is just the excess marble. And what we learned is I probably don't even need the list because every time I make a list, life gets in the way and changes the list. Well, it's a preliminary list. Like, like Richard said, you need some data. <laughs> so Tom, talk to us about your uh, your relationship to uh, your home or your house and the stuff in it. I would love to, because uh, I know you've thought about these things. I think about it all the time. I have, as you know, a small house. It's about 650 square feet, but I did build it myself with my own two hands. And so it's very personal to me. And I used to have lots of stuff. And my aunt, my dad's sister, a few years ago, she lived in an apartment and she died. And my mom said it took weeks to go through all of her 
stuff and get rid of it all. And most of it was worthless. She had her, <laughs> my favorite story, she had her bedroom in a closet. She had an entire shelf of the boxes that checks came in and they were empty, but they were all stacked up. And when, when mom, and she, I mean, just, you know, like 40 cake mixes and, mm -hmm. and just so much stuff. And so um, I thought, you know what? I don't want to die unexpectedly and have people have to deal with all my crap. Yeah. So I started a, a, ne a never ending project of editing stuff down. And I am pretty darn spare at this point. I have, there, there are very few things in this house now that I do not use on a regular basis. And it sure feels great. Like I, I like you said, it's spatula. I had, you know, a huge set of knives, carving knives. I just gave them away because I realized there was one knife that I used all the time. So just that's that's a pretty good example of what I mean. I, you know, I got rid of so many clothes, shoes. I, I just I have very very few things, and it not only is it it's 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 a real sense of freedom because I'm not encumbered by stuff, and if I ever did have to have to move suddenly to Canada or say <laughs> or somewhere, I wouldn't have much to pack up. And that feels really good. It's, it's such a freedom mm -hmm. and a sense of security in a strange way in that respect that, that I have so few material possessions. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the, the, the stuff, the house, it, it's the house itself. It, it's funny because I'm sure everybody goes through this at some point with their domicile. It's, I love it. And yet I sometimes get bored with it and sometimes get frustrated with it and then we'll fall in love again with it for some reason. It's, it's, a, it's almost like it has a personality. And again, I think everybody probably feels that way about the way where they live. But um, I guess maybe because I actually did build this myself, it has a, an enhanced version of that feeling. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> no, Nadine knows there, I'm constantly giving things away to Nadine, which she now has to get rid of. I really, you're, you're not part of the problem. You're not, you might see. So, you know, it's, it's right. You're, 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 you're projecting your minimalism away, but then on, but it, it's, it, right, it's, it's sort of like when you, you know, a, a butterfly effect, right? You, you, you throw some, right. you throw a pebble in the ocean and it causes a tsunami somewhere else. Well, Apparently Nadine's house. It, yeah, and you know we have the same taste, which is I I actually bought a whole house of furniture from you, uh, and and then it's crazy because I actually moved your side table that really nice. Uh, oh, apparently now it's your side table, but yeah, right, the mid-century <laughs> modern one you had, and the, I the sort of uh, uh, the uh, the amoeba shaped one. No, the one with the shelf underneath it. Another one that you. Oh, get. right, 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 right. Yeah, the blonde wood. Uh, yeah, and I'm like, right. I, I may have, I don't, I, I don't know what's, it's, um, it's it, I'm thinking, who can, who can use this? So like now I'm trying to connect everybody with my access. So I'm trying to, I'm uh, like Tony, I'm gonna try and push it onto someone else. But hey, you yeah, need like a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> do, do you need an end table? It's like Herbalife. Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think Janis Joplin, right? She says, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. I think that's where the freedom comes in, right? That you won't have that sense of loss, you know, once- That's exactly what if, she says, and she's right. Yeah. If you don't have that end table, you won't miss it when it's when it's not there. I think yeah. Porgy says that also in Porgy and Bess. Oh yeah? I got plenty of nothing and nothing's plenty for me. Yeah. I got no lock on my door, that's no way to be. <laughs> Right, and I think even Thoreau says you can't have treasure that people can come steal. Like you have to have time as the treasure. But uh, you know, it's and yeah, I'm not a I'm not a minimalist. I'm not a minimalist, and I've picked up people along the way in my life who are also there. They're definitely I'm I'm shoveling against the tide. So I'm hoping I'm I think we're revisiting our relationship to stuff. 
and how um, we we need to be a little more judicious with our spatulas and our uh, end tables and et cetera, et cetera. And obviously I have a lot of clothes as well. So I'm looking at that like, wow, I'm, I'm, my lifestyle will not be the teacher. So I will have to find a, a couple of teachers in my size that I will uh, <laughs> bequeath, bequeath the uh, collection. How do you start that conversation? Like, like what's up here? Yeah, like, yeah, you know, it, it seems a little bit like Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs, you know, it's like. Well, now that I've been doing the, well, when I was doing the thrift store, I was eyeballing it and I was, I would try and underestimate people's sizes because I don't want to offend anyone. And then I'd get the real size. And then the and then I would go up a little because it's the Corona thing. So someone would say, "Oh, I'm like a you know an eight ten, and I'd say, "All right, let me get them the ten twelve. Uh, because vanity, vanity sizing. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, this I I know this is this was big, maybe big on you, but maybe you want to yeah. try it." This, uh, this brand right? This brand runs small, right? What you, yeah, what you so, yeah. Or this is what came in, I, but. Uh, you know, and, and having done the sorting at the thrift store, you just see people want to get rid of their stuff. They want to donate it. The volume, the poundage, the sheer poundage of clothes we go through. Uh, and we're not even open. We're begging them. We have signs. To please don't drop stuff off I, because we can't, we can't, we're storing anything. And I'm, you know, it's, yeah. There's actually an NPR report about where all of these things go and how they end up being carted off to uh, countries in Africa and how it's creating huge ecological damage there. Uh, and also it's, it's, it's ruined a lot of the local textile industry in those countries because if, if you're getting tons and tons, you're being inundated with supply and the demand is the same, it's going to kill pricing. Uh, so it's actually... It's created uh, secondary markets for all of these clothes. So it's created jobs in one way, uh, but it's also devastated um, local economic development. So think about that. And I don't, think about, that. Yeah. I don't think about that. And then, <laughs> you know, and then here's, all right, I'm going to confess something since, since, hell, we're just having a chat now about stuff. Yeah. Sometimes, like, there was a Prada skirt that came in. It is not my size, but because mm -hmm. it's a Prada skirt, I'm just keeping it. I'm, I'm just going to, maybe I'll hang it on the wall. Maybe I'll, I'll, wear, it, <laughs> I'll, wear, I'll wear it as a cape. <laughs> but anyway, or a very large belt. So you don't notice it doesn't fit me. I'm going to wear it, Tom. I'm going to come to your house in the woods in my Prada <laughs> And we'll, we'll have vegan blue, the, vegan blue cheese. Have you guys seen the George Carlin skit about stuff, about like stuff and after it's buying houses to fill that, fill it with stuff. And once you have, once you have enough stuff and you need more and you need another house for more stuff. And I feel called out. I feel, I feel, <laughs> I feel shamed, Richard. Thank you so much. You know, they have that Swedish cleaning. Have you heard about that? It's called Swedish death cleaning. That's if I die. Would anyone want this? Mm. And the Swedes are particularly good at this. I, that's uh, like I guess it's like. Or is it like Swedish fish? It's really from New Jersey. <laughs> Next to Maxwell House. 